So how does rhetoric fit into a classical liberal arts education and why is it important to us today? Well, if we look back a couple of centuries to John Henry Cardinal Newman, we can look to him for an understanding of liberal arts education that I think is quite good. He writes in the idea of a university that the man who has learned to think and to reason and to compare and to discriminate and to analyze, who has refined his taste and formed his judgment and sharpened his mental vision, will not indeed at once be a lawyer or a pleader or an orator or a statesman or a physician or a good chemist or a geologist or an antiquarian, but he will be placed in that state of intellect in which he can take up any one of the sciences or callings I have referred to or in any of other for which he has a taste or a special talent with an ease, a grace, a versatility, and a success to which another is a stranger. I say that a cultivated intellect, because it is a good in itself, brings with it a power and a grace to every work and occupation which it undertakes, and it enables us to be more useful and to a greater number. I appreciate his lines for a couple of reasons. First, Newman defines liberal arts education in terms of cultivating the intellect by learning to reason, by forming one's judgment and sharpening one's mental vision. Secondly, I appreciate the way he turns the tables on the utilitarians of his day. Newman wrote in the idea of a university to answer the utilitarians' claim that the university education was not very practical or very useful. The utilitarians believed in maximizing the greatest good to the greatest number. They felt that society would be best served by institutions of higher learning that educated in practical skills. And ironically enough, we still have the, that same disagreement or that same tension in education today. Newman, in his erudite way, elucidates why liberal education enables us to be more useful and to a greater number. Now that's well said. At any rate, in order to master any art, one must first define it, then break it into its parts. And in order to understand classical liberal education, I think that we need to go back and start again with Aristotle's definition of rhetoric. Realizing, of course, that the debate over the proper definition of rhetoric predates Aristotle, and understanding that Aristotle and Plato are not the only voices to speak to us of rhetoric from ancient Greece, but they are important to our understanding of rhetoric in this course. And of course, we are working towards a biblical understanding of rhetoric. So let's look back to the classics, the ancients of classical Greece, to get that bedrock foundation of Aristotle's definition. Remember his definition? He said that rhetoric is the faculty of discovering, in any given case, the available means of persuasion. Early in his treatise on rhetoric, um, Aristotle puts forth this definition. Now many before him simply defined rhetoric as the art of speaking. However, he was dissatisfied with this reductionism, so he decided, no doubt prompted by comments attributed to Socrates in the Phaedrus, to take a more philosophical tack in his rhetorical treatise. Aristotle realized that his students needed a theoretical understanding in order to acquire an art of rhetoric. And so, therefore, Aristotle focuses on cultivating in his students the power to formulate lines of argument on all manner of practical questions. In doing so, he identifies three arenas of such enterprise, forensic, deliberative, and epideictic. That is, forensic, which is arguing before the bar, deliberative, which is making one's case before the assembly, and epideictic, which is engaging in ceremonial speaking. Much of the rhetoric, then, is spent elucidating lines of argument useful in these three contexts. Aristotle also talks about something called proofs, which he says are a necessary element of rhetoric. Aristotle identifies two types of proofs, artistic and inartistic. Inartistic proofs are merely used by the rhetor, while artistic proofs are invented or crafted by means of art. Examples of the former would be testimony, facts, and so on. Aristotle then divides artistic proofs into three modes, ethos, pathos, and logos. Aristotle notes that in order to persuade, 
the words of the speech must evoke a fellow feeling in the audience and the order must put the audience in the proper frame of mind and of course must give them good reasons for adopting the position being argued. Artistic proofs are those invented by the rhetor. This word rhetor means one who practices rhetoric. And in artistic proofs are merely used. So we merely use testimony, facts, evidence, statistics to support our argument. So those artistic proofs formed by the words of the speech itself are most fully developed are the most fully developed when they combine good logical support with appropriate appeals to passion and are spoken so as to underscore the trustworthiness of the speaker. So all three of those modes, logos, pathos, and ethos, are critically important to creating a persuasive argument. Remember that learning rhetoric was, according to Aristotle and Plato, learning to speak the truth to fellow human beings in a way that respects their freedom and helps them excel as human beings. Rhetoric, again, as defined by Aristotle, is the faculty of discovering in any given case the available means of persuasion. And so therefore, rhetoric is a study of persuasion that includes logical, ethical, and artistic components in its pursuit of truth and its artful presentation of that truth to real people with whom one wishes to cultivate and maintain a social bond. So rhetoric is a tool to be used in our social interactions with each other. Rhetoric was, for much of Western history, considered to be the cornerstone of a liberal arts education. Now if you'll remember, we're going back and looking at um, the classical foundations of a liberal arts classical education. And in order to do that then, let's look and see what the Greeks did in their classical education. The Greeks had three divisions of education, the productive arts, the industrial arts, and the liberal arts. The first two were education for slaves, where slaves were taught to make things or to use and maintain their tools. Liberal education, on the other hand, was designed for free persons and hence the word liberal, which has the meaning of liberated in this sense. This was education for citizens in which they learned to be good judges, make good laws, exercise leadership, and generally be at home in the realm of ideas. They were equipped to exercise their freedom and it was felt that in exercising freedom they would achieve excellence. You have to understand the Greek concept of excellence. For them, excellence went something like this. Every creature has something it does uniquely and better than any other creature. So the excellence of the cheetah is speed, and it realizes its excellence in running. And they went on to identify excellence in every single creature. So for example, the excellence of the ant is organization, the excellence of the elephant is its size, and so forth. So what would you suppose is the excellence of the rational human being? What would that be? right, to think, to reason, to analyze, and to argue. In short, to be at home in the realm of ideas. And so, in a classical Greek education then, the liberal arts were those arts that taught the citizens, the free, liberated people, to be at home in the realm of ideas. Now, moving through the centuries, we see that during the Renaissance, Schools and universities look back to the classical period to formulate their curriculum. And a Renaissance education was comprised of two components, the trivium and the quadrivium. And each component, trivium and quadrivium then, were broken into sub-arts. The trivium, which were considered to be the tools of learning, was broken into grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric, while the quadrivium, which were the subjects of learning, was broken into astronomy, geometry, arithmetic, and music. This week you'll read an essay by Dorothy Sayers entitled The Lost Tools of Learning. In this essay, she teaches a very important point about the difference between the trivium and the quadrivium. Sayers says that the trivium were taught as tools, while the quadrivium were subjects. The trivium helps form and discipline and order the mind. 
It helps to cultivate the intellectual virtues that equip students to be at home in the realm of ideas to both learn and to discuss them. And if you notice, the third component of the trivium is rhetoric. And so rhetoric then provides the foundation or the cornerstone for students to be able to learn and be at home in the realm of ideas. So rhetoric has a very important place in the classical liberal arts education.